Hello everyone, this is Scott with US Ignite. I'm going to do a series of short videos on Docker. We're going to start with an overview of Docker and I'll produce other videos later that actually get into command line operations of Docker, a view of Docker Compose and a few other things like that. But I just want to start with conceptually what is Docker, what's it doing underneath the hood and what are the components of it so we can set up our conversations later on in other videos. Right, so first, what is Docker itself? Docker builds itself as an open platform for distributed applications for developers and system admins. It's basically a way of packaging software into an, a virtual image that can be shared uh, between systems, uh, downloaded by developers and launched as Linux software container services. Uh, it's important to notice that the, the internals of a Docker image are Linux and Linux only, although it can run on any number of systems, Mac and Windows and Linux and different flavors of Linux, the internals of the container itself are a Linux image, so be aware of that. It's an open source project that started out as a rewrite of .cloud. .cloud is a sort of a Heroku competitor. They wanted, they were looking at how they manage these containers and how they deploy them within their own service, and they rewrote that entire set of code, uh, and that is end up, ended up what became Docker itself, and they're using some version of that behind the scenes as well. It's really focused on shipping software as well. It's not really a virtual image. It's not, it's not intended to run as just another way of doing Vagrant or uh, or something like that. It's really just it's really intended for the shipping and running of software, not f to create a, a separate OS. The containers themselves and the images themselves in Docker are minimal versions of OS so that you can just get the software up and running so that the memory footprint stays low and you can run multiple containers on a single server as needed. So it's different in that way from Vagrant and uh, things like and VirtualBox. Docker is actually a whole set of set of tools. When people say Docker, they usually mean Docker Engine, which is really the component that that manages images and runs individual containers. But Docker comes it's, uh, itself with a whole ecosystem. There's Docker Container, uh, Docker Engine, excuse me, which runs the, the images, as I said. There's Docker Machine, which sort of runs on Windows and Mac to provide a virtual image to run Docker in the background. There's uh, Docker, um, there's Docker Swarm, which lets you run and coordinate multiple containers across a whole suite of uh, of cloud servers that are not on the same host. There's Docker Compose, which allows you to coordinate and manage Docker containers which are running on the same host. So, that, And there's Docker Universe, which manages cloud, Docker Hub. There's a whole bunch of things that are out there that allow you to kind of manage your Docker ecosystem. You want to get to know those over time. Today, we're going to start primarily with what Docker Engine does and what the composition of that is theoretically, and a couple of core concepts that you really need to get baked into your mind very early on if you want to deal with Docker containers well. All right, at US Ignite, I'm with US Ignite. The way we're using Docker here is what we have is a number of metro areas that are participating with us to develop this gigabit infrastructure and gigabit applications in these communities that help sort of spark the next generation of gigabit app development nationwide. So as such, we want these applications to not only be developed in our local metro areas, but we really want to be able to transfer those to other metro areas and allow, allow our cities to run applications developed in other metro areas in theirs with minimal uh, hassle and get them out the door and running for them and benefit the public. So we are porting these applications in the meantime to an uh, experimental cloud infrastructure called Genie, which is run at uh, community anchor institutions, universities basically, in our different met metro areas. And we want to be able to have those portable to these Genie racks with uh, Docker software so they can be easily deployed. So we're going to have that run in my city option that someone can really lower the bar to deploying and running an application in their city. So if you have a telemedicine application or a transportation infrastructure application or anything like that, one metro area can run it in another metro area. And we can really leverage that, that success in each one of our metro areas and achieve that sort of one plus one equals three uh, enhancement for one another. So it's sort of also a controlled environment. Getting it in a Docker container means that eventually if we need to get it out of a Genie Rack into a local cloud host, if we want to really take that into a production service and mature it in a way, it doesn't have to be tied to the Genie Rack uh, implementation and deployment. It's a way to sort of future proof it from the, the liability of specific server infrastructures and getting it into a Docker container helps us do that to some degree. 
learning resources for Docker. You know, I always, I'm always sort of mixed on these, these YouTube videos. For the most part, if you're a developer, you're probably out there learning it, but it often, often it helps that, uh, to have a, a video to tell you what, what to look out for, what, what heads up you should be aware of as you get into a certain type of technology. So I'm always torn on how useful these videos are, but I hope this is useful for you. What I recommend is when you really start to learn it at depth, get it, the Docker site itself has tremendous, tremendous documentation. It's constantly kept up to date. Go ahead and look at the Docker site and read their documentation. It's pretty clear, it's concise. And again, it's the best part is it's kept up to date and Docker evolves very aggressively, very aggressively. Since my last video, uh, which I think was maybe a month and a half ago. They've changed their networking ar architecture between containers. They've changed some of the internal plumbing, which I'll get to in this presentation. And so when I say they aggressively update it, they do, and it's to the benefit of the community. All the updates are very good. Thus, occasionally they're disruptive, but really the, the amount of disruption is low to compensate for, so don't be worried about that. So get on the Docker site, read their documentation. Also, Take a look at YouTube videos out there, but understand that they may be out of date. As I said, Docker updates aggressively, but a YouTube video, maybe this one even, will be out of date within a year or so. So make sure you're kind of checking what we're saying here against the Docker site itself. And it's highly recommend. I, I at least highly recommend the Docker book by James Turnbull. Uh, uh, no, no relation there, by the way. But uh, it's really a great book. It's sort of the the book people tend to refer to in most Reddit's and uh, and online discussion forums. If you get the the Kindle version of it or one of the e versions, you can sync it to the latest update. The book is kept updated, which I very much appreciate. That book. It's a lot a lot of great insight, and it's really geared for people running Docker at the command line and what you need to know and of course play around with docker the best part about it just like any virtual image is you can you can launch it set it up try it out and then blow it away and set up another one and you can just do that until you feel like you have a really good grasp of it so really get in there and just try docker use it uh, at length all right so why docker at all and why Docker as compared to vir traditional virtual machines. So hypervisor or, or, um, or VirtualBox or, and Vagrant, they, they come with the paradigm of they have, they sit on top of a guest, uh, guest OS, right? There's some sort of hypervisor running under it. They, and the virtual image itself comes with a full guest OS in, in the virtual image. On top of that, then you install the, the binaries and libraries that you want to add on top of that virtual image and then the application on top of it. So these virtual images in, in a traditional sense, they tend to be very large in comparison to the Docker images because they're an entire OS on top of an entire set of dependencies on top of an entire, entire application running on top of a hypervisor, running on top of the host OS system. So they're very, they're very resource intensive and they're not really ideal. They're ideal for insulating you from the underlying server architecture, but they're not ideal for really just deploying lots and lots of applications. And that's the problem that Docker really wanted to try to solve when it got into this space. How do we take these containerized, isolated sandbox virtual images, but cut them down so you can run them quickly and you can run multiple images. You can bring them up and down very quickly. And that's, that's what Docker wanted to solve. So Docker containers themselves, they run natively on the operating system. Now, currently that's Linux, and I'll get into this in a little while, but uh, it will soon be native as well on Mac and Windows. It is a beta version of that out there. The intention is it runs actually with syst operating system resources. A Docker engine and some of the components of that actually negotiate to the underlying operating system. So all the Docker container should contain is some minimal OS uh, very minimal with some binaries and libraries in, in, in the application itself. So the image should be focused on the unique components about your application and your deployment with minimal uh, layer for the operating system. And then it, it uses in Linux right now anyway, it uses the container services that are native in Linux to, to leverage the local Linux operating system. It'll do similar things when it's running natively on Windows and Mac, but right now it really only only runs, or at least the production version only runs on Linux. So that's something to be aware of. So it runs very lightweight. You can run multiple containers on the same service with very minimal overhead. And it's only a, a millisecond, very fra very fraction of a uh, fraction of a millisecond in terms of additional response time for networking. So for most apps, it runs very, very well. One of the critical set of the concepts that you have to get your head around in terms of using Docker is there are two 
components of sort of what they call containers and Docker images. There's an image and there's a container. An image is a static, a static file system version of what a container will look like when it runs. So an image is just all the files, all of the changes, all the operations that are going to happen when the container runs that's sitting, that's sitting there at rest on disk waiting to be run. A container is an instance of an image running in memory. So the way I tend to, to frame it is that it's uh, the image is equivalent of a, of a, a class definition in programming parlance and a container is an instance or an object of that class. So uh, that's what you need to keep in mind. That Docker itself will manage images, pull them down from the cloud, allow you access to them, but they stay static. You, Whenever you launch an image, there's a read-write layer put on uh, uh, on top of the container. It runs in memory. You can change the container. You can add things to it. You can take it down, but the underlying image is not changed. You always launch from the image and it's pristine from its image state. You can sit, you can make modifications to a container in memory, save that as a new image if you want, and kind of version, version images over time. And that's one of the strengths of Docker. But it's important to get the concept that images are sit, are basically a version of a virtual environment on at rest on disk and containers are launched image uh, instances of that image all right docker is evolving as i said we used to just refer to docker engine as one sort of giant component that ran and managed uh, images and containers but now that's being split out as as a aggressive effort by the docker developers to componentize all of the elements of docker so that you can swap out pieces and it can run uh, on different operating systems and different environments and has greater flexibility uh, in general. So recently, and I, I mean recently within the last few months, they announced that they've broken out the underlying plumbing of Docker down into sort of, it's still Docker engine and that wrap, wraps uh, container D and then uh, runs C. Docker engine still sort of manages images themselves, pulling it down and listing the images and all that. Con, uh, that's Docker engine. Container D goes ahead and actually manages the, the launching of images itself. And Container D will launch an image and hand it off to Run C. Run C actually runs the actual container on file system. So there's a single instance of Docker engine which manages the images, a single instance of Container D on, a, on an individual system that runs, a, that manages the launching of an image, and then multiple instances of Run C that actually run the isolated sandbox container that's coming out of Docker. So the, what this allows them to do is they can swap out the individual uh, component needs and shims related to run C so that it can run natively on different operating systems. Right now, um, Docker only runs natively on on Linux systems, as I said, the uh, even on Windows and Mac, there's something called Docker Toolbox, which allows you to run it on Windows and Mac. But in reality, what that does is start a bare bones virtual Im Linux image on either Mac or Windows and allows Docker to run on top of that. And there's some special considerations you have to make about how you connect to the IP of the containers that are running into it. And it's a little bit of a hassle. However, with greater support from the Windows community and Mac community, they're gonna be making Docker run natively on uh, both Windows and Mac. I know the Windows version is in beta right now. Uh, I'm not in that program, but I've, I've been paying attention to it. I believe the Mac version is as well, but I'm not I'm not as connected to that. Although I have a Mac, uh, I ha I've been using Docker Toolbox in the meantime. Given the, the sort of overall scheduling of of Docker and how those components come out quickly, I would imagine the next few months this will be expired and it will be a native application running on both Windows and Mac, and uh, and it'll be much better for it. You'll be able to run these uh, these these Linux services directly on either one of those systems. So Toolbox will be going away. You won't need to worry about Docker Machine anymore. If that doesn't mean anything to you, I wouldn't really care because in a few months it won't it won't matter. But um, if Docker Machine you won't have one, it'll run natively on Linux and Mac probably in the bash shell on windows but we'll have to see that how that develops that said i know on windows one of the big gotchas for windows is it's going to have to run on only on windows 10 pro that is because hypervisor will run the virtual instance of docker and and help run those images uh, and containers so that that's a little bit of a, a barrier for windows user i think it'll run on whatever version of um of Mac. However, the Windows uh, 10 Pro is a paid upgrade for most users. I think it's 99 bucks for an upgrade if you already have Windows 10 Home Edition, and it's something like 200 for a, a brand new copy of Windows 10 Pro. So that's a bit of a hassle, but 
it's it's a great feature. That's not Docker's fault. That's sort of what what comes wrapped up in Windows. Uh, Windows 10 Pro does offer a bunch of great features, though. I do think it's worth the upgrade. You you should consider it if you're a developer and you want to get into this space. Uh, I assume that some version of Docker Toolbox will be continue to be available for Windows Home Edition, but who knows? We'll have to see how that, that evolves in the future. Okay, let me wrap up with the, what you need to install Docker. In future videos, I'm going to get into actual command line. And this is going to be a PowerPoint presentation, a little boring, but just to give you an idea of the environment. So you have this Docker engine that has container D, all this stuff that you need to install in your local system. In this, there's a package installation available for Arc Linux and OS, uh, Debian, Fedora, a bunch of different types of Linux, flavors of Linux. And there's binary distributions available for other flavors of Linux where there isn't a specific package. Um, as you, if you've used Ubuntu or, or, or Fedora before, you're probably aware a lot of the YUM and app packages are often out of date and out of sync. And since Docker is so aggressively updated, you really don't want to use the native YUM and app, app packages for it. You, you really want to go, there's some instructions for this on the Docker website, but register the Docker, repos the Docker repository itself as a source for these packages and then pull down from there. Those are very, those are updated as often as Docker is, so you can always make sure you have the latest version of Docker. Currently, you have to download Docker Toolbox for Windows and Mac. Uh, I mentioned before that, that, uh, that that's going away, but it runs a Linux VM, a, a light Linux, Linux VM on your system. You'll have to make some special considerations when you try to attach to that uh, container or you try to run, let's say, a web application through an IP uh, address. It won't run off uh, the, the native local host. You'll have to find out what IP Docker machine is running as. There's great instructions for that. It's really pretty easy. It's great for development and running local apps, um, but soon that's going to go away and Docker will, will run natively on Windows and Mac, in which case Toolbox is going to go away. It's still sort of unknown what the rate of Toolbox is for Windows Home Edition, as I mentioned, but people are looking at that. I can tell you that the at least my experience with the latest uh, set of developers, both in the Microsoft arena, the Mac arena, and the Docker arena, they're very forward thinking, they're very user focused. So I expect there's gonna be some sort of support for them uh, in the meantime. But Docker is a great easy way to get these apps up and running. I use it, uh, I used to use Node a lot for a lot of local applications when I wanted to develop on a Linux, uh, on a Windows machine. Um, I used to run Vagrant a lot for that as well. And now really I'm almost switched entirely to Docker for a lot of these things to run these applications, whether I need a, a ad hoc web server or anything like that. So there's a lot of features for that. So that's the introduction to sort of the overview of Docker, what the components and the pieces are and what conceptually is going on. Future videos, I'm gonna cover a lot of command line stuff so there won't be as many slides. Uh, thankfully, I'm not a big fan of slides, but I need to get that conceptual business out of the way. So I'll do that in the future. I look forward to, to talking and putting out those future videos. I'll link some of these resources in the show notes. If you have some questions, please post them to the YouTube channel here and I'll try to answer them as best I can. And I will look forward to those other videos. Thank you for taking the time to look at this.